As we continue now with our study of the history of ideas, I've mentioned before that when I used to teach philosophy in the university, and uh, I found that many students, particularly beginning students, had great difficulty making the adjustment from other disciplines and other courses to this abstract arena of philosophy. And so I would tell them as they were looking at the various philosophers, I said, try to discern as you're studying these philosophers what problem they were trying to solve. Because if you understand the problem that the philosophers are grappling with, that uh, goes a long way to help you understand uh, the way in which they think and the reasons that they go on the paths that they go. Now here we are having finished our little overview of 17th century rationalism and we've introduced John Locke as really the key figure for the 18th century response to rationalism which is called empiricism. And I have told you that throughout the history of philosophy the two major concerns and issues, by no means the only issues that philosophers are concerned with, but the two major ones have been metaphysics and epistemology. And I've said that in the 17th and 18th century, in this debate between the rationalists and the empiricists, the focal point of the discussion tends to be on epistemology. But that can be a little bit misleading because even though we distinguish between epistemology, which you recall is the science of knowing, how we learn, how we know what we know, and metaphysics is the quest for ultimate reality, that which is real but above and beyond those things that we perceive with the senses or the outward realm of physics. And so we make this distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. But as I've said many times, we can distinguish them, but we cannot really separate them. Because it was not simply that the rationalists and the empiricists of the 17th and 18th century were merely occupied with the question of how we know things. But ultimately, they were concerned about the reality that we're trying to know. So they never abandoned that quest for knowing the real world. Now again, I want to go back and do some uh, review work. You remember when we looked at Plato, I said that Plato was very much concerned with the task of science and philosophy to save the phenomena. And what that meant for Plato was we encounter all these things that appear to us in our daily ordinary experience. Those things that appear to us are the phenomena of life, the phenomena of this world. And what the philosopher and scientist was trying to accomplish in antiquity was to come up with a theory or a system of thought or a worldview that would make sense of all this widely diverse phenomena. And so the different theories in philosophy have been attempts to construct an understanding of reality that would give us some kind of possibility for science. Because that's what science is. Science is about knowledge, an attempt to understand the world around us, the world outside of us. And so we have two questions here. What is really out there? And how do we get to it? And I've also said in the past that what we're wrestling with is what's called the subject-object problem. Let's again go over that quickly. I am a thinking subject. I am an individual person. And I find myself here in a world that exists outside of me. And 
I, as a subject, am trying to come to an awareness or an understanding of the objective world that exists apart from me. But remember back when we talked about Augustine and the bent oar in the water. The world is not always as we perceive it to be. So there's the question that links epistemology and metaphysics. How can I overcome the limitations of my view of the world and get to real truth? Now, again, historically, the science of epistemology is not just simply how do we learn and how do we gain knowledge, but it's also concerned with how can we achieve certainty? How can we know what we know for sure and get out of Plato's cave of shadows and of opinion and of idle speculation and pure guesswork? How do we solve the problem of the subject relating to the object, the objective world? And we've seen that the two basic methods that scientists and philosophers have followed historically are deduction and induction. Deduction and induction. Now, you hear about deduction when you hear the stories, see them on TV, or read the books of Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes comes to the scene of the crime, and he takes his magnifying glass out, and he, and he thinks about what he's observed, and he deduces uh, the, the actual crime scene, what actually happened, and even who done it. And his assistant, uh, Dr. Watson, will say, you know, Sherlock, how did you figure that out? And he will say, elementary my dear Watson, and then you'll get another experience of this keen, acute way of deducing things that uh, he was fond of doing. And we've mentioned that induction is where we move to knowledge by observing or encountering little data bits out there in the world, and we move from the particular to the general or universal. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's how it works. I look at a squirrel. Never seen a squirrel before. And somebody says, oh, there's a squirrel. And I look at the squirrel, and I see that the squirrel has a bushy tail. So I associate bushy tails with squirrels. And I look at the second squirrel, and it has a bushy tail and a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one. I look at a hundred squirrels, and every squirrel that I look at has a bushy tail. Now, I don't have time to explore every nook and cranny of the universe and to examine the makeup of every conceivable squirrel that lives in the universe. But after a certain number of repetitions of observations of particular squirrels, what do we do? We generalize, and we come to the conclusion that all squirrels have bushy tails. Simple. Isn't this how we do science? But you notice when we see the opinion polls that are taken where a group of individuals are questioned about certain things, how they're going to vote in the next election, or what, what is their view of the latest scandal coming out of the White House, or whatever it may be. And then whenever we're done with the polls, they'll tell us that there is a, uh, an error margin there of plus or minus, say, 3%. Now, why do the pollsters tell us that? Maybe it's because they don't want to have the same thing happen that happened in the 1948 election between Harry Truman and Thomas Dewey, where the Chicago paper, when, they went to, when everybody went to bed that night, it seemed like it would be a victory for uh, Dewey. And so when the paper went to press, 
that you had big, bold headlines that says Dewey wins. But in fact, Dewey didn't win <laughs> during the night. Uh, the momentum shifted and the election went to Harry Truman. And so there was a case where they had sampled enough returns to come to a conclusion, but when they got more information in the hopper, they had to change their conclusion. Now, I illustrate that because these are things that we see every day in our lives, and yet they indicate the built-in problem with induction, the built-in limit to this method of knowing. And the limit is this. Nobody has ever examined every squirrel that can be found. And what if suddenly we come upon not one squirrel, but 15 squirrels that don't have bushy tails? Now we have to change our whole theory about squirrels, don't we? Because here we have examples of squirrels that don't fit our universal or general description of squirreliness. In fact, maybe if you've been listening carefully in the last five or so minutes, you have a much more astute understanding of squirreliness, but you're associating it not so much with bushy-tailed animals, but with bushy-haired philosophers. But in any case, this is the problem that we have built in to science built in to the inductive method, and it's even built in to language, as we will see. Now, so when we look at the difference between deduction and induction, we'll go back and review this bidding. With deduction, we have the famous uh, syllogism that you've all heard of, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now here's the question. If this premise, which we'll call premise A, is true, and if premise B is true, if those two propositions are true, how certain could we be about the conclusion in terms of zero to 100 percent? Would we have to put a margin of error of 3 percent in terms of this conclusion? No. We could eliminate the percentage of possible error entirely. But again, that's only if all men are mortal and if Socrates is a man then we can know with resistless logic, with what we call formal certainty, absolutely that Socrates is mortal. Again, this is based upon the formal rules of logic and the laws of immediate inferences. If all men are mortal, if everybody in this particular class, that is men, ha share a common attribute or predicate, which is mortality. And then we find a particular example of an individual human. If all individual humans that make up this class of men have the same attribute of mortality, then we would know with absolute certainty that this particular individual that we've just encountered is mortal. So the formal process of reasoning from propositions in terms of logical deductions yield certainty. But now if I just come up to you and I say, Roger Amundsen is mortal, this particular human being is mortal, how would I know that, that that's true, if he's still alive? Or to put the question another way, do we really know that all men are mortal? Or do we assume that all men are mortal? 
How do we know that all men are mortal? What have we done? We have, through the process of induction, examined millions upon millions and millions of individual human beings and find that they all died. And so in every one of these cases, we see mortality connected with their experience. And so we then generalize. We come to the conclusion from the particular, this man dies, that man dies, this man dies, this man dies, every person we've ever known has died. And so we come to the conclusion, well, this must be something that is shared in common by every human being. But do we know it for sure? In other words, have we had an empirical experience of every human being who has ever lived? How do we know that the generation that we make up is not the first generation in all of human history to be immortal? Well, we laugh at that because we say, well, that's just inconceivable. No, it isn't inconceivable. It's just extremely improbable, astronomically improbable, in light of the pattern and the history of the examples that we have. Now, how can I ever know with certainty that all men are mortal? Well, you can say we can have a nuclear war and every person that's now alive in the universe is annihilated, and I, I alone am left. And now I can come to the conclusion that everybody that's who's ever lived has died. So I now know for sure that all men are mortal. What's wrong with that picture? Maybe I'm the singular exception in all of human history. And maybe I am not mortal. So that the only way I can know for sure that all men are mortal is posthumously. <laughs> See, that's the limit of induction. We can never have a fully exhaustive collection of individual examples. But we don't need to wait to examine every squirrel or every human being before we have a working knowledge of universals, or what we call scientific laws. That if we once arrive at a certain number of examples that prove to be true individually, then we universalize or generalize. Now, there's a reason why I'm backing up and going through all of this, because, again, what was motivating the thinkers in the 17th century was, I want to get to that realm of knowledge that's absolutely certain, 100% certain, no plus or minus 3%. And the empiricists come along and say, well, the only place you can find 100% certainty is in the formal realm of reasoning of the relationship of different ideas to each other. But how does that get you to the real world? And it doesn't. And so the empiricists like John Locke are coming along and they're saying with their tabula rasa concept, no, 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 no. The only way we know anything initially is by having an experience of it. We see it, taste it, touch it. We're from Missouri. We're from the show me state. Don't just theorize about these things. Give me empirical evidence that such and such a thing is true. Now, that's part of the, the uh, framework and fabric of our culture today, isn't it? I mean, we hear this all the time. Don't talk to me about what you believe in God and all of that sort of thing and these rational arguments that you give for the existence of God. I want to see them. I want to hear them. Show me the money. Show me the deity. Because if I have an empirical perception of it, then I know for sure. Well, unfortunately, the more your knowledge rests upon sense perception, the less 
certain it can possibly be because of this problem and because of the limitations involved in looking at each and every possible example. So, empiricism is always limited by the finite samples that we have to study and is always vulnerable and exposed to the possibility that the next discovery will present a gigantic anomaly. An anomaly is something that doesn't fit the pattern. An anomaly is something that can't be explained by the system. And when you have too many anomalies coming, you have to throw away the system and create what we call a whole new model or a whole new paradigm. You've heard the expression paradigm shift, which means a shift in the model, a change in the model. And paradigm shifts are, in science are driven by anomalies, things that don't fit the old model that say we're going to have to broaden that model or scrap part of the model, come up with a new model that will help us get a handle on reality. So, in addition to this, as we progress through history, with the advent of science, as we move rushing into the 18th century, two things were happening. On the one hand, the world was getting bigger. Now, I don't mean by that that it was growing, but our understanding, the human perception of the world was increasing dramatically, principally through the discovery and the use of the telescope. We realized that there was far more out there than anybody ever imagined, and that we were living in a neighborhood that we call the universe that was far bigger than anybody had ever anticipated. And yet, not only did we find that the world was getting bigger, but also that the world was getting smaller. The world was getting smaller. With the discovery of the microscope, we began to see a whole realm of reality that we never knew existed. In fact, we've come to understand that so much of our lives are dependent upon things that are out there in that objective world that we can't see, taste, touch, or smell with our naked senses. We need more advanced tools like microscopes to even realize that there's all this activity going on at the microscopic level that can affect our very existence. We see that in the field of medicine when microbodies are invading our organic uh, health and destroying it and so on. So these problems push the philosophers constantly to sharpen their understanding of two things. What is real? And how do we get to what is real? 